just an outline of my uh, presentation. I've broken it up into to two parts. Uh, first, I'll uh, talk about a, a, a more simple liquid crystalline network and how it's uh, used to control the shape memory behavior of uh, materials. Uh, and then I'll, um, in part two, talk about um, a um, multifunctional uh, approach to expand on that capability uh, to add uh, photoresponsive behavior, as well as the shape memory behavior that can be triggered either by temperature or by light, and the incorporation of dynamic ester bonds in order to uh, facilitate recyclability, reprocessability, uh, and uh, self-healing. So first to uh, the, the shape memory material, but before we go into that, let me give a little background about liquid crystals. Uh, liquid crystals are a phase of material that's something between a, a liquid and a crystal. Uh, and the uh, idea of a liquid crystal is something that would have orientational order, that is where molecules are mostly pointing in the same direction, uh, but not three-dimensional positional order, like a, a crystal where molecules are arranged in any sort of an ordered lattice. And there's different phases or different types of liquid crystal. For example, a pneumatic crystal uh, phase would have no positional order, but they self-align to have a long range directional order. Uh, or a smectic phase where uh, well-defined layers are, uh, are formed and are thus positionally ordered, but uh, along one direction. Uh, liquid crystals are used uh, ubiquitously in, in society today. Uh, for example, in uh, liquid crystal displays, and uh, they take advantage of the ability to uh, orient these mesogens, these uh, um, units in the liquid crystal, um, using electric fields, magnetic fields, other other sorts of um, mechanisms to order those um, those phases. Another property of liquid crystals is that they uh, have a reversible phase transition from um, uh, oftentimes from a liquid to uh, an, an amorphous liquid phase to uh, the liquid crystalline phase. Uh, and this, this illust is illustrated here. And here we have a, an example of a liquid crystalline material that would, would transition from a, a solid crystal uh, at 22 degrees to a liquid crystal. And then from, as you increase temperature, more from a liquid crystal to a liquid. And you can see in the photograph there, as it goes from a, a crystalline solid to a liquid crystalline liquid, that's still opaque. And then as you heat it up beyond the liquid crystal to liquid transition, uh, it goes from uh, an opaque material to uh, a, a transparent material as it becomes completely amorphous and, and no longer scatters light. Well, liquid crystals have been uh, um, proposed and, and the, the first idea of developing cross-linked liquid crystalline polymer networks uh, was proposed by Nobel laureate uh, Pierre Gilles uh, de Genes in 1969. Uh, the, the, the basic concept is shown here where you'd have a, a rigid core, uh, the, this mesogen, that would be uh, uh, connected by flexible spacers to multifunctional reactive groups like acrylics uh, or epoxies. Uh, here in the bottom left, there's several different uh, uh, examples of these monomers that have been used for making liquid crystalline networks. And those networks can be cross-linked uh, highly, you know, highly cross-linked networks into a glassy solid, which could be used in uh, structural applications and have shown to have some uh, advantageous uh, mechanical properties or they could be lightly cross-linked into an elastomer uh, that would be uh, able to uh, be used in more functional applications such as, such as in shape memory uh, polymers. So in, in uh, this first part of the presentation, I'll talk about one of the systems that we uh, investigated. Um, and that's uh, shown here. We've got a, 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 a diepoxy, that's a, a diglycetyl biphenyl, I'll just call that BP for the biphenyl, uh, cured with a, a, a dicarboxylic acid called sebacic acid that cr creates that flexible linkage. Um, 
the uh, the reaction mechanism between the epoxy and the carboxylic acid is is somewhat complicated. It involves several parallel reactions as, that's shown here. Uh, the first step involves the ring opening reaction of the epoxy by carboxylic acid, uh, resulting in the formation of uh, a linear oligomer with carboxylic acid groups on the end as further reaction sites. Uh, this step is, is really considered crucial for the liquid crystal phase formation because the aspect ratio of, of the bisphenol mesogen alone is not high enough to exhibit the liquid crystal behavior. Um, but the addition of the sebacic acid increases the mobility of the, of the BP by introducing aliphatic chains onto the monomer and facilitating their self-organization into an ordered liquid crystalline phase. So then the second step involves a cross-linking reaction through the hydroxyl groups formed in the previous step. Uh, they can react either with the carboxylic acid through an esterification reaction or with epoxy through an etherification reaction. And, and that chemical bond formation during this step um, was shown to be dependent on the stoichiometric ratio between the, the bisphenol and the sebacic acid, which greatly influenced the liquid crystallinity and the network structure of these networks. Uh, in this work, um, we looked at different uh, ratios of the, of the epoxy and the diacid um, to prepare the liquid crystalline elastomer. So specifically, I'll show data for three different ratios of BP to SA of 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 1.0. Those are molar ratios. And that's a tool then that we can use to tune the thermal mechanical properties of the material. So um, one of the tools we use is uh, thermal analysis uh, techniques like, ther like differential scanning calorimetry. So here are some thermograms in the top left corner um, that shows that the three different uh, the, um, liquid crystalline epoxies, the different ratios of, of BP to SA uh, exhibit different glass transition temperatures. So for example, here for the blue line, where there's a step change in the heat flow, we can uh, assign a glass transition temperature as a midpoint there uh, of about 55 degrees C. And then uh, it goes from a, through a glass transition. And then there's a uh, endothermic peak on heating, uh, which corresponds to the transition from the, um, from the uh, liquid crystalline phase to the amorphous phase. Um, the, uh, the transition temperatures uh, were affected by the, uh, by the uh, ratio of the bisphenol and the sebacic acid. Um, as the decreasing um, amount of, S of the SA curing agent uh, indicates there's a, there's a formation of the liquid crystal was, was reduced. Um, and, and so we see a visual comparison here down in the bottom left um, with different compositions in which the, um, the uh, 0.7 molar ratio and the one molar ratio uh, samples appear more opaque because of their higher degrees of liquid crystallinity um, that ca causes light scattering. In contrast, the low molar ratio here in the, uh, the top image uh, appears more transparent because of the limited number of liquid crystal domains in the network. The glass transition temperatures as shown in the the table was also influenced by the stoichiometric ratio um, and the uh, liquid crystal elastomers uh, showed a decrease in, in glass trans transition temperature as more SA molecules were incorporated into the system. In the bottom right, we see fracture surfaces of the liquid crystal elastomers with different compositions. Um, as the stoichiometric ratio increased, an increase in roughness of the fracture surface was observed. Uh, considering the fact that the liquid crystal domains deviate crack propagation and, and result in rougher crack fracture surfaces, the SEM results indicate a higher number of liquid crystal domains in the higher molar ratio. Uh, we uh, can further characterize these liquid crystal and uh, materials by doing uh, tensile tests. So this shows a stress strain curve uh, above the glass transition temperature um, for the uh, in this, in this case, the, the molar ratio of one. Um, and, and the 
um, stress strain curves for all of the liquid crystalline uh, elastomers exhibits a plateau region. And this is indicative of a poly domain to a mono domain transition with stretching. Uh, in, in addition, in the uh, bottom uh, uh, photos, we see uh, two-dimensional x-ray scattering patterns of the unstretched and the stretched film uh, that we can use to quantify the structure. Um, for example, in the unstretched film, the bottom left uh, image, um, the, new, the two major concentric, concentric rings in the unstretched case uh, indicate the presence of a smectic uh, liquid crystal phase. The inner sharp scattering ring was attributed to the periodic layers of the smectic liquid crystal structure with an average layer thickness of about 15 angstroms. And the outer diffuse scattering rings, which corresponds to a diameter of, or to a, a despacing of 4.2 angstroms, resulted from the scattering of neighboring mesogens in the smectic layer. Uh, the degree of orientation of the mesogens going from zero, which would be unoriented, to one, which would be completely oriented, uh, that can be evaluated by the intensity distribution ar around the, the radius for the stretch cases. So for 100% strain, um, the orientation was calculated uh, to have S is equal to 0.756. Uh, when we increase the strain to 200%, that orientation parameter increased to 0.824. So uh, how can this be used? Well, the, the, uh, these transitions, the glass transition, and then the uh, liquid crystal to amorphous transition can be used uh, to, to uh, create this triple shape memory behavior. And that's shown here. Now in this case, and, and this, this is the, the, the molar ratio of one case, the uh, material can be first programmed. So we start with a permanent shape. I used the letter U uh, when this work was being done a, a couple of years ago. We were, I was at Washington State University. So we were able to make a transition of the, the W, S, and U. Um, that permanent shape is uh, heated up to, uh, to uh, uh, 160 degrees above the, uh, the glass transition temperature and then cooled down to 85 degrees to create the, the temporary shape. It's then deformed uh, further uh, at that temperature to the third shape. And this is I'll call it temporary shape w, uh, two to create this W. Uh, and then we can heat this material up to recover the S and the U. Uh, so I'll show that here in a, in, a, uh, in a video. Let's see. Um, so here first, the relaxation, we, we take the, uh, the W, this temporary shape two, heat that uh, up to uh, on a hot plate that's set at 85 degrees. And you can see the polymer transition to the temporary shape number two, the S shape. We can then take that and heat the hot plate up to a higher temperature, a temperature above the glass transition temperature. And then it goes from the, uh, the S shape back to the permanent shape, uh, uh, the U shape. So it's going from the rubbery liquid crystalline phase to the rubbery uh, amorphous phase. And so this is that triple shape memory behavior that we're able to demonstrate with these uh, two important uh, transitions. Okay, so that's the, the part one, the basic shape memory behavior. And in part two, I wanted to uh, look at a more complicated system. One that not only has shape memory behavior with these uh, triple uh, shape memory behavior with these multiple transitions of a glass transition temperature and a liquid crystalline, uh, phase transition temperature, but also one that uh, incorporates uh, dynamic ester bonds to create a, a opportunity for self-healing uh, chemistry. We've done some uh, work over the years in, in uh, self-healing materials using microcapsules as well as using supramolecular uh, interactions and dy dynamic covalent bonds. We want to incorporate the, the latter into these materials. And also, how can we use other stimulus other than just temperature to uh, activate these kinds of materials? Uh, one way would be to add a chromophore, uh, such as azobenzene, into the polymer. And so uh, this is what I'm considering a, a really a multifunctional design. Let me talk about what, what, that, what that is. First, the building blocks to, uh, to do this. 
So for our, our rigid core, rather than the BP molecule, we've used a, a molecule that's got a, that's a chromophore uh, using azobenzene uh, that's uh, got an epoxy uh, on both the sides of the rigid core. And then uh, using the, a curing agent similar to what we used in the other work or the same, the same curing agent, sebacic acid. Uh, and in this work, I'll just show uh, those with a epoxy to carboxylic acid molar ratio of one to one. And finally, we add a ring opening transesterification catalyst uh, that I've designated here with the uh, abbreviation of TBD, uh, used in an amount of five mole percent uh, of carboxylic acid groups. By incorporating these three materials together, we can create a, um, a liquid, a crystal, liquid um, crystalline epoxy network, but that has some additional functionality. So first of all, characterizing this material, we similarly to the other one I showed, we can show a, a glass transition temperature here about 51 degrees and, uh, and then heating it up further, it can transition from the rubbery liquid crystalline material to uh, a uh, amorphous rubber at just above 100 degrees. So these are two key temperatures. I'd like you to try to remember a glass transition temperature just above 50 degrees and a liquid crystalline transition temperature just above 100 degrees. Similarly, we can characterize this uh, and show that it's a smectic liquid crystal with uh, certain sizes that can be strained to uh, increase the orientation uh, of the uh, liquid crystalline messages. So a little bit about those building blocks. First of all, the incorporation of this photoresponsive chromophore uh, azobenzene into the liquid crystalline molecule uh, allows the material to convert light energy into mechanical work because of the transformation between uh, two geometrically different uh, azobenzene isomers upon light irradiation. So that can happen in two ways. One is the photoisomerization of trans and cis isomers. So as, um, as uh, you take the, the more uh, thermally dynamic or thermodynamically stable trans isomer of azobenzene uh, under UV light, it will uh, transition to a cis configuration uh, as shown here. And then uh, with, uh, with uh, natural light, uh, we'll um, transition back to the trans configuration. Um, the other way we can use light to change the uh, material is by using polarized light. So the, the, uh, um, uh, using a linear polarized blue light, uh, we can transition this back and, and, and forth until we can align the molecule perpendicular to the polarization direction of that blue light. So for this latter, uh, let, me, let me show you what I mean. We, we took our material as, as a thin and, and cast it as a thin film. And in this first picture, first image, um, the, the polarization direction is in the Y direction here on the screen, uh, up and down. And when I do that, um, I'll, I'll shine the light. What applying that blue light, polarized blue light does, um, is the molecules line up perpendicular to that polarization direction. That causes the length of this film to, uh, to contract as the molecules line up perpendicular to the light uh, and, and creates this bending effect. Now, if we move, if we change the direction of the polarization, if we flip the lens and have the polarization go uh, into the screen, yeah, then uh, this is what happens. It will actually line up the molecules in the direction of the, uh, of the film uh, as shown in the diagram on the, on the bottom right, causing that film to push away from that uh, blue light that's uh, shining on the one side. We can not only show this uh, activation, we could also use that as a way to shape, shape shift. So for example, if I, I do the same thing again, uh, I can apply the light and it causes the material to, to bend outward. If I remove the light, it stays in that outward position as shown on the right. And then I reverse the polariz polarization direction again. Whoops, let me go back and uh, hit the play button. Now I've got this and it can pull it back. So we can use light to, to shape shift this film. Um, likewise, we can use light to uh, 
induce the liquid crystalline phase transition. We can do that thermally. Uh, so if I, if I heat that material up, where initially that material is opaque, and let me hit the, the button here, as we heat that up uh, above the liquid crystal phase transition, you can see that the material becomes opaque. You can see through it now as these letters underneath are revealed. Uh, we could also use light to do that because of the uh, change from the uh, cis-trans um, isomer of the um, azobenzene. So here in this video, we apply uh, uh, UV light to the, uh, to the sample that's initially opaque. And as we do that, uh, we, we've disrupted the liquid crystalline phase and it becomes uh, uh, transparent uh, because it's no longer liquid crystal as we break up that liquid crystalline uh, phase. So um, this material, similarly to the, uh, the other one, can, can uh, be used to create a shape memory effect. Again, we've got these two transitions one at 50, just over 50 degrees, the, the glass transition, and the liquid crystalline uh, transition over 100 degrees. And so we can create a, a permanent shape, say a box, that we heat up above, um, above the uh, liquid crystal transition to a temporary shape one, and then we cool that to the uh, liquid crystalline uh, glassy, uh, the, the rubbery liquid crystalline phase, and then cool it down to the glassy liquid crystalline phase for a temporary shape two. And then with heat, we can, we can recover those shapes. So here it is as a video. Um, we, we start out with the temporary shape two, heat that up above the liquid crystal transition temperature. I'm sorry, above the glass transition temperature to unfold that material. And then we can uh, heat that up even further heat that up even further to uh, go through that second transition to get to the final uh, recovered permanent shape, in this shape case, a box. So we, 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 it folds back up to create a, uh, the final permanent shape. Well, uh, that can be done by temperature, but it can also be done by, by, uh, heat, uh, by light. And so, and just like before, but rather than with temperature, we can, we can go from the temporary shape two. We can apply a, we can apply a, a UV irradiation. Um, however, here the liquid crystalline phase transition is in, is mainly caused by a thermal effect rather than a photochemical effect, as in the trans cis isomerization observed in the case of the bending behavior. Here I'll show the next video, uh, which shows then going to the permanent shape. So, so in other words, the, the UV light uh, was strongly absorbed by the azobenzene molecule and converted to thermal energy, thus inducing the liquid crystalline phase transition. Uh, the, the video demonstrates UV-induced triple shape memory behavior of the liquid crystalline networks with consecutive shape recovery process, this unfolding and reassembling uh, of the liquid crystalline network. And compared to thermally induced shape memory, the use of light offers multiple levels of control, i.e. via wavelength, intensity, position, polarization. Um, that strong photothermal response of the material can be used uh, for other applications as well, such as self-healing and stress relaxation. Uh, so that third functionality I wanna introduce is the self-healing functionality, the reprocessability. Um, so although liquid crystalline networks offer remarkable properties, their practical applications are limited in part because of the difficulties in reprocessing of the materials. Uh, as a result, there has been growing interest in designing polymers using dynamic covalent chemistries. Uh, the in introduction of dynamic ester bonds into the epoxy or, or liquid crystalline epoxy systems that are based on a trans esterification between the ester and the hydroxyl groups creates thermosetting materials that are remoldable or mendable. Uh, that exchange reaction can be thermally activated at the topology freezing transition temperature, uh, we call it TV. Uh, and at temperatures below TV, the exchange reaction is extremely slow so that the material exhibits a fixed topology and behaves like a, a permanently cross-linked thermoset. 
while at temperatures above TV, the ester bonds undergo a fast breaking and, and reforming, uh, thereby allowing for the rearrangement of the thermoset's topography, uh, to, topolog topology. So again, by adding this, this transesterification catalyst, this TBD, um, we, uh, we can create this um, transesterification reaction to, to occur above the uh, topology freezing transition temperature. Um, in the bottom right, we can, we can uh, determine the transesterification initiation temperature by doing a simple creep test, test as we ramp the temperature. So here we've got something that's under a, 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 a uniaxial tensile load of 0.1 Newtons. And then the LCN film is, um, is show, starts to exhibit large dimensional change at about 150 degrees C, indicating a fast breaking and reforming of the ester bonds. So um, how that can be used then is, is for example, we could um, take a, a, a film and, and we could cut that film in half. We can press that back together above that, that, te that temperature and reconnect them. So the slide here shows an application, uh, the thermally induced healing of the broken liquid crystalline network film uh, was achieved by hot pressing, in this case at 200 degrees C for two hours. And then the peeled film um, could, could be used uh, similarly. So here shows another fig, uh, couple images showing that same behavior that we get with the, uh, the virgin film. Um, we can also use this as a way to, uh, to process. So the reprocessability of the liquid crystalline network was investigated here. We've, we've taken the original film chopped it up into small pieces, put that between a couple glass slides and, and heated it up at 200 degrees for four hours to recreate this film. And, uh, and then the thermomechanical properties are similar to those of the prepared film. So this is a way to process this material somewhat like a thermoplastic at a temperatures above that transition, but then uh, it still has those, those same multifunctional properties. Finally, we can use the, uh, this capability uh, to exhibit self-healing materials. So here we we show uh, an image of a, a block of material where we've taken a razor blade and scratched uh, material. And then uh, uh, we reduce those uh, scratches significantly after UV irradiation for 15 minutes at uh, an intensity of, uh, in this case, uh, about 240 milliwatts per cubic or per, per square centimeter. So this self-healing functionality can be achieved through this uh, mechanism as well. So uh, in conclusion, we've, uh, we've shown uh, three different um, functional building blocks. Um, uh, this approach of preparation of, of multifunctional liquid crystalline networks through the combination of the azobenzene chromophores, uh, liquid crystals, and dynamic ester bonds. Uh, I think our approach provides uh, excellent compatibility of the functional building blocks and results in materials that are photoresponsive and have the ability to shift shape, uh, also undergo optical healing and to be reprocessed. So we hope that these results and these materials will contribute to the fundamentals of liquid crystalline networks in general and aid in the design and application of practical multifunctional systems in the future. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my co-authors on this work, specifically Dr. Yuzhan Li, uh, who started with me as a PhD student and, and continued as a, as a uh, postdoc and a, a scientist, uh, both at Iowa State and at Washington State University, and now is at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, as well as uh, Yu Hong Zhang uh, and Orlando Rios, as well, and uh, my other um, former uh, group members that have contributed to this and, and other work.